I'd like to introduce you to a young woman that we'll think of as Sarah. Sarah's a 14-year-old eighth grader. She has asthma. She has a family history of diabetes, and she has gluten sensitivity. She lives near a major metropolitan area. Her parents don't have a car, and they would be considered a low-income family. Thanks to billions of dollars in investment in biomedical research, we know a lot about what happens within what we call the ohms within Sarah's body. So we've invested in gaining knowledge about her genome, the DNA, in every cell of her body. We've invested in learning about her proteome, the proteins that perform all of the functions in Sarah's body. We're beginning to learn a lot about her microbiome, all of the bacteria, viruses, and other organisms that live either on or within Sarah. We're starting new initiatives called the Connectome, where we're trying to gain deeper understanding of the neurons in Sarah's brain and how those contribute to the functioning of her brain. Yet, what creates an ohm? What are the characteristics of an ohm? Especially the number one characteristic is that they involve massive amounts of data. For example, the genome consists of 20,000 genes that are encoded by 3 billion nucleotide base pairs that we inherit from each parent. The proteome consists of 250,000 to 1 million unique proteins that are encoded by those genes. The microbiome consists of what's estimated to be 10 trillion cells of non-human organisms living on or within our body that influences numerous aspects of our health. And that's actually 10 times more cells that are non-human than human in each of us in this room. That's a very amazing concept to ponder. The connectome. Our brain consists of 10 to the 10th power neurons, and those are connected by 10 to the 14th power connections between those neurons. So what does it take to understand each of these areas? It's computationally intensive. It involves what's thought of as big science, so major public and private investments to understand each of these aspects of how a human being works. They're also highly collaborative, so it requires collaboration between computational scientists, biological scientists, and clinical experts. The efforts to utilize this new knowledge in the delivery of patient care is currently referred to as precision medicine with the goal of using this knowledge to inform more effective healthcare decisions for each individual and to lead them to more effective outcomes. I've spent much of my career defining strategies on how to incorporate omic information into electronic health record systems and then to develop capabilities that enable healthcare providers to use that information to inform appropriate decisions for each patient. So for one example, there's a common blood thinner called warfarin. Many of you may know about it, many of you may take it, some of you may have family members who take that drug. Warfarin dosage is dependent on genotypes of primarily two genes. So increasingly we're recognizing that prospectively testing patients for those two genes can lead to an effective dose for that patient. So we've implemented and innovated in how to incorporate that into clinical decision support. So this is an alert that would pop up if a provider made an order at a dosage that was genetically inappropriate for that patient. As we did this work, what became concerning was the realization that many healthcare providers, we wanted them to want this information, but they didn't necessarily want to have this information. They weren't necessarily ready to make the changes in how they practice. To support that concern, we did a research analysis related to HIV treatment. So since the late 1990s and 2000s, the technology has been there to sequence the HIV viral genome for a patient and then determine whether or not they're taking a therapy that is genetically compatible with their virus. We did an analysis of 441 patients with the retrospective study and found 441 with a resistance genotype in their virus to a particular HIV drug. We found that 
239, more than half of those patients were taking the drug to which their virus was genetically incompatible. So that drug was not going to be effective for those patients. What was particularly concerning was recognizing that six months later, after those test results had been delivered, 42 of those patients were still taking that drug. And that was against the knowledge of those test results. Equally troubling, 59 of those patients were initiated on that drug, despite the results that would clearly convey that that, result, that that drug will not be effective for that patient. Those patients had poorer outcomes. They had a higher viral load, and they had lower CD4 counts than the patients whose therapy was effectively um, consistent with their genotype results. 36% of the healthcare providers involved in this acknowledged after the fact that they had indeed made decisions that were in error and that did not make appropriate and effective use of this complex omic information. So we can see that we can provide inf um, this detailed information and hope that providers will use it, but they are very challenged to do that. Now, none of this is to say that there haven't been major successes with the biological omics. There are new diagnostic tests, there's new biomarkers for early detection of disease. There's definitely improvement in how we manage cancer patients using this knowledge. We have a better understanding of how many diseases work. There are anecdotal examples of successes of full genome analysis for single patients. And there's definitely a growing level of in consumer empowerment. But there are also many failures. Providers, in general, are reluctant to use even accepted genetic knowledge, much less genomic knowledge from the emerging knowledge of the genome. So consensus among providers in how to use that information is rare, and their training about how to use this information is generally poor and lacking. There are few new treatments that have resulted from the omics, and those tend to be very expensive, and the reimbursement pathway is very difficult to nav navigate. Meanwhile, there are many conditions that are on the rise. So for example, asthma prevalence is increasing. Thyroid cancer has increased 2.8 fold in the past 24 years. Food allergies, we all know about peanut sensitivity in childcare settings, but we don't know why that's happening. Autism is on the rise. These are not likely to be due to changes within our body, but rather to changes in the external things that we're exposed to. Another thing that is deeply troubling is that the most predictive aspect that we can know about a patient that will help determine how long they live is where they live. So this is a very troubling study from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and it um, has data specific to Kansas City. So Interstate 70, Highway 71 is just two or three miles away from here. People who live in the Armour Hills neighborhood have an average lifespan of 83 years. People who live in the Blue Hills area have an average lifespan of 69 years. Three miles and a 14-year difference in lifespan. And for many of us who know the Kansas City area, we can think about some of the socioeconomic factors that may be involved in that, but I can guarantee you that our healthcare providers don't have easy access to that information. We'll talk about how we can change that. So I think that as we think about the challenges of using complex omics information and these evidence that there's a lot happening outside of us in our context that influences our health, that it's time to start thinking about a new ohm, and that is to reuse an, a label, the envirome, and that was coined in psychology, but I'm suggesting that we use it in a much broader sense. And that consists of our exposure to risk factors, so air pollution, water contamination, toxic chemicals. There's massive amounts of data about each of those. And then the resources that are available to um, healthcare access, high quality food access, education, green space, transportation. These are all um, external factors that influence our health. Turns out that there are large amounts of data available about these topics as well. So for example, we know that 3.6 million people do not obtain adequate health care due to transportation issues. 
25% of low-income patients at least once per year miss an appointment because of transportation problems. Food deserts. 23.5 million people in the United States live in what's called a food desert. This means that they have to travel more than a half mile or a mile to reach an adequate food source for fresh food. 13.5 million of those persons live below poverty. There's large amounts of data about air quality. 53,000 organizations have reported toxic releases to the EPA, and that data is widely available. 300 cities, including Kansas City, have real-time particulate sensors in their cities, and that can be used to inform asthma management, COPD, and even cardiovascular um, cases, where there's a higher incidence of cardiovascular issues at times when air particulate levels are high. Toxic chemicals. There are 84,000 unique chemicals registered with the EPA. We have only known toxicity information about 200 of those because reporting is only voluntary by the chemical industry. But we do know what companies are making those products, we know where they are, and that's information that can be available for the environment. So our theme today is simple solutions. I think there are data-driven solutions that can be utilized. <coughs> so the first example I'll give is using socioeconomic data at the point of care, and this can include information about average income and education, but also information about food deserts. The way we do this is my team at UMKC has developed what we call the Envirome Data Service. We've loaded the 2010 census data and USDA food desert data into this Envirome Data Service. That can be invoked by electronic health records and research applications. So they pass us a zip code or a census tract, and we pass back the context information from those data sources. So let's look at this in a more tangible example. Let's begin with two sample patients. So these are simulated patients at Children's Mercy Hospital in a test environment, but they've been designed to represent the two regions that we discussed earlier. <clears throat> Through the census data, we can see that a person coming from the region represented in green is surrounded by people where the average household income is $144,000. We can see that persons coming from the region in orange, the average household income is $29,000. The average educational level in the region in green, more than 78% of the population has a college degree. In the area in orange, fewer than 10% of the people in that area have a college degree. What I'm showing you here is a very simple method to put this information at the fingertips of the providers during the time of a patient encounter. Let's take the food desert example as another um, simulation. So for those same two sample patients, when we look at the food desert context, it's very striking the difference between those two areas. There are basically no food access issues in the region where people tend to live 83 years. In the other region, more than 2,000 people in that census tract are considered having low access to adequate fresh food supplies. Many of those people also have limited access to vehicles to travel beyond their neighborhood to access um, fresh food. So how can you use this information in a conversation? What I'm not suggesting is that a provider say, so I see you live in a food desert. But rather, they would say, I'm concerned about your family history of diabetes. And I want to make sure you know where to find affordable gluten-free foods. There happens to be a new grocery store on the blue bus line at the Main Street exit. You put this information at the fingertips of a provider, and that becomes a conversation that's very easy for them to have with their patients. And unlike the omics, it's also very accessible within the current training medical model. The second example that I want to give demonstrates how housing quality data can be utilized to lead to novel health interventions. Some of my colleagues at UMKC have developed what's called the city scope, where they have evaluated housing tracts in the urban core of Kansas City. 
They basically drive up and down every street and document 15 to 20 features for every residence on those blocks, including roof quality. So when you think about asthma, one of the risk factors is exposure to mold. So if you have a leaky roof, your house is likely to be more prone to having mold. What happens when you take that data about housing quality and combine it with clinical data about asthma patients? Here's what happens. You can identify patients with asthma from households that are in a home with a deteriorated roof. Where does that take us? Turns out that the cost of a three-day inpatient asthma admission is twelve to twenty-four thousand dollars. The average price of a new roof, twelve thousand dollars. So what if we think about a future where healthcare providers can prescribe a new roof and not only benefit that child with asthma, but everybody else living within that home. And then what if that new roof were to have solar-powered shingles and reduce the energy expenses? Think about the social entrepreneurship and nonprofit opportunities that this mindset of the environment can lead to. So to conclude, I'll just give a few other examples, the, especially the one on the bottom. So the EPA also provides mapping information that shows sites that have reported their releases of toxic substances. It also shows Superfund sites. What happens if you put that data at the fingertips of an oncologist when they're talking with a cancer patient? It opens up new doors, new opportunities for them. That's why I think that the environment is where um, precision medicine meets public health. Thank you. <laughs>